Let me put it this way. I, I, like, I like to think that God is real. I don't believe in God because the idea that an omniscient, loving being would judge me who is mortal and ignorant based on a few years' experience, I find to be rather a cruel thought. All the power that God has, he, she, it has given to me. So we're definitely one. Uh, I hope, I hope there's, there's something else out there. It'd be, it'd be fun to experience either that or we're all just evolved apes. Um, I was raised atheist. I don't believe in a higher power, but I also don't claim to know everything about the world. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if there is one. I just pretend, I guess, and hope that there's something else out there. Put your hands together. Let's give God a hand praise. Oh, wonderful, 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 wonderful. I'm so excited that we are kicking off. Uh, this is our second week of Explore God. Today we are dealing with the question, is there a God? Would you just ask the person next to you, do you think there's a God? <laughs> Let me begin by welcoming <clears throat> all of you, those of you who are here, those who are watching online, it's a joy to be with you. I especially, as has already been done uh, by uh, Christine and uh, Matt, I just want to add my welcome to those of you who are joining for the very, very first time. And <clears throat> I simply want to say that whether you have been a person of faith for 40 years or whether you are not a person of faith or whether you're somewhere in between, we are so delighted that you are here engaging in this journey, exploring the reality of God with us. Can we just put our hands together and celebrate on behalf of all of our guests? We're so happy, so happy that you're here. Now, let's just jump right in, and then I'll give a little context for those who are with us for the very first time. If you'd stand, please. And uh, in, in the, with the backdrop of this passage being, is there God? The Apostle Paul writes these words in Romans chapter 1, verse 20. Here's what he says. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, meaning his eternal power and his divine nature, have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been, everybody shout, made. made. All right, please be seated. <clears throat> Let me give you just a little context, just for those of you who are joining us for the very first time. Uh, we are dealing with life's big questions. And uh, last week, we engaged the question, does life have a purpose. This week, we're engaging the question, is there a God? Next week, we're going to take up the question, why does God allow pain and suffering? And so, if you've missed, uh, if you missed uh, last week's message, I encourage you to go to our website, and you can uh, get that. Each message builds on the other. I want to encourage you to reach out to your family and friends. There's a lot of folk wrestling with this question, why does God allow pain and suffering? Somebody say Amen. So this is a great time to invite them, to connect them to what's going on. I am also excited because we're not doing this alone. There's about 175 uh, churches and Christian communities now. That number keeps growing from Santa Rosa all the way down to Santa Cruz, uh, having discussion groups during the week, teaching on the weekends. As a matter of fact, there are now discussion groups taking place on San Francisco State University campus, UC Berkeley, and Stanford campus. Come on, let's celebrate that. That's wonderful. And uh, equally as exciting for me is that NBCC alone, just as our own congregation, uh, we have 176 discussion groups that are taking place across the Bay and virtually. Can you go ahead and celebrate that? That's just outstanding. So my challenge to you this week is the same as last week. Join the discussion. Tell somebody next to you, join the discussion, join the discussion. And there's two ways for you to join the discussion beyond just being here and worshiping and listening and watching online. First of all, you can form a group. Uh, just identify about you know, five to seven people that you're going to reach out to, family and friends, people that you know and that you trust. 
uh, share with them the questions, ask if they want to meet and discuss this on a weekly basis at a place of your choosing, and then be a part of our weekly worship and teaching either here in person or online. So you can form a group. And I think you'll discover that most people you reach out to, you'll be surprised to know we're wrestling with these questions. But if it's just one person that says, yes, you plus another is a group. Secondly, you can join a group. Either of those options are available to you. And we're going to have, we have a table in the back. So immediately following this worship gathering, you can just go back to the table and they're waiting to uh, get you connected. Uh, and if you're online, you can just go to our website and we'll get you squared away. Now, here's the key though. If you want to participate in the group, this is the, this is the point. This is what you got to keep in front of you. And that is that we want every group to be a safe place. Can you say safe place? Safe place. That means that we're not manipulating people. We're not uh, twisting arms. We're not demeaning or disrespecting people who disagree with us. That these groups, uh, you know, the teaching in the group will come from a Christian perspective. I'm teaching from a Christian perspective. But it's in dialogue. Shout dialogue. dialogue. With a variety of perspectives uh, and we expect each group to be a space that is safe and respectful and welcoming to all of the different perspectives that are there. Can we say amen? amen. Let's celebrate that. Let's celebrate that. That's, this is a, you're hearing a church say this. This is a big deal. And we mean it. It's extremely important because I believe that if we create the right context, that God will show up in transformative ways. None of us have to be God. Tell the person next to you, you don't have to be God in the group. Just be yourself, all right? <laughs> God can show up and take care of God's business. Amen? Amen, amen. All right, let's get started. That's context. That's context. Let's get started. Is there a God? There is the question, a challenging, important question, especially as we live in today's world. When I was in undergraduate uh, school at Grambling State University, I ended up being a double major, philosophy and history. Part of why I was a philosophy major is I walked into my first philosophy class and just fell in love. The department head was the teacher, Dr. Reverend, who became an advisor and a dear friend of mine. And I remember when we first got in an introductory course to the question of God. I was super excited. I was a serious Jesus follower at that time, young person. And what Dr. Reverend said initially offended me. And here's what he said initially. He said, when it comes to the question of God, he said this, it is a meaningless question. Now, I just want you to know I was immediately offended when he said that. But then he went on to explain what he meant. He went on to say that he didn't mean that it was meaningless as it relates to how we live our day-to-day -day lives. It's important whether or not we think God exists in that context. He meant that from a philosophical standpoint, because philosophy is primarily about making arguments that can be definitively proven or not proven. And philosophically, he says, that it is uh, not possible for us to definitively prove that God exists. Nor is it possible for us to definitively disprove God exists. That is the perspective that we will begin with today. I am not trying to definitively, I agree with my uh, former philosophy teacher, to definitively prove that God exists. Can't do that. We ain't going to try to do that today. Uh, and I'm acknowledging that no one can definitively disprove it either. But here's what I'm arguing. Here's, here's the perspective we take today. There are clues and hints that argue persuasively, I believe, for the existence of God. And while I don't believe that God can be proven definitively as one that exists, I do believe God can be experienced. Somebody say amen. amen. And so that is the tact that we will take today. We will look at clues, shout clues. We will examine hints, shout hints, and we will talk about whether or not we can enter into an experience of God individually. So in that context, I want to suggest that you do two things from a mindset that will help you to walk along with me. 
The first thing I want to suggest is that if you're in this room and you're approaching this topic with doubt, first of all, I say again, welcome. I'm so elated that you're here. And if you're approaching this topic with doubt, I just simply ask that you will choose open doubt over closed doubt. Closed doubt is the person who says, I don't care what you say or show me, etc. I will not believe. I prefer to challenge you to be like Thomas in the Gospel of John chapter 20. When, when uh, on the other side of Jesus' resurrection, the 11 disciples was left because Judas had taken his life. Ten of them was in a room one day and Jesus shows up physically in the room. The people are just tripped out. Everybody shout tripped out. That's an old fashioned word. Y'all don't use that anymore. <laughs> That's my generation, all right, tripped out. <laughs> they were like, what? All right, then later on, uh, Thomas shows up, and they said, hey, T, I guess they call him T, I'd call him T, Thomas. We have seen the Lord. And he was like, uh, I will not believe it. Now, that sounds like he's closed, but watch what he says. I will not believe it. Unless, shout unless, yes. unless I can see him and I can place my hands in the wounds that was generated by his crucifixion. Here's what he's saying. I won't believe it unless I can have my own experience of him. So if in fact you are with me and says, okay, I'll approach this with an open mind. Just say simply I'm open-minded. I heard just it was kind of silent, but that's all right. <laughs> My mind is open. The second context that I want to challenge you to think this through with me is really this context. If you believe that there is a God, then you essentially perhaps will conclude what the writer of Proverbs 16.4 says. That God has created everything everything according to his own purpose. That means that everything that you and I see has God's purpose and God's meaning attached to it, whether it's uh, the person sitting next to you, the earth spinning on its axle, the blooming of a flower, it all has God's purpose attached to it. But if we do not believe in God, then that would mean that everything that we see, the person next to you, the earth spinning on its axle, the flower blooming, is simply the byproduct of what I call a cosmic accident. So what I want you to think about as we move through this, even if you think in terms of probability, I just want you to think about the question, is this an accident or is it God? Say it with me, accident, accident or God? That's the framework that we want to work through as we move forward. Now, everybody shout clues, clues. shout hints. Yes. All right, <clears throat> the first clue that we want to examine real quickly is what we really read about uh, in our passage today, and it is simply called the clue of design. The suggestion is that in all of creation around us, from your human body to the universe to the atom, that when you look very closely, you will discern that there is such sophisticated design that it's hard to conclude that this is an accident rather than of God. Here's what the writer Paul says in Romans 1.20. He says this again, and this is what he's referring to. From since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, meaning his eternal power and his divine nature, have been clearly seen and understood from what has been, what? From what has been made. And that was his way of saying, if you look around you closely, you see enormous evidence that God exists. Take, for example, Albert Einstein, who revolutionized uh, the way we think about physics and science today, back in the 20th century. Uh, it, the older he got and the more he looked at the scientific data that he was concluding, 
the more uh, the record suggests that he began uh, to reach the conclusion when he asked the qu question, accident or God, that he came closer and closer to, to concluding this can't be an accident. And then what I find to be remarkable is in the last, say, 40 years, here in America in particular, there have been kind of a slow, subtle decline of the number of people who believe in God. On the other hand, during the same period of time, there have been some notable scientists, can you say scientists, who have come to believe. Now, some of these scientists believe in they're not necessarily Christians. They have a faith belief in God, but they're not all Christians. And when they think about God, they think about God in some different terms. And yet, at the end of the day, when they ask this question, is what I'm looking at, is it the byproduct of accident or of God? Remarkably, these scientists are concluding, hmm, it's got to be more than an accident. God is involved. Take, for example, Dr. Paul Davies. He is a leader in the field of quantum physics. He is a department head at the University of Arizona. And here's what he writes. The laws of physics seem themselves to be the product of increasingly ingenious design. There is, for me, powerful evidence, he says, that there is something going on behind it all. It seems as though somebody, say somebody, Somebody has fine-tuned nature's chambers to make the universe. The impression of design is just overwhelming. Now, when he says that someone has fine-tuned uh, the chambers of nature to create the universe, the chambers of nature, sometimes you can talk about it in terms of constants. And what he's really referring to is those physical laws that make the universe possible, like gravity and the magnetic field and, and the speed of light, those kind of physical laws. And here's what he's saying, and scientists all over will agree, if those laws had been tweaked just slightly a few inches in one direction, the universe wouldn't have appeared. No planet, no stars, no atoms, no conditions for life, just a sl slight tweaking in one direction, boom, it wouldn't have appeared. Or if you tweak those laws in another direction, just, twi just, just slightly, he says the universe would have appeared, this is what scientists says, but it would have imploded. Or another slight tweaking, it would have appeared, but it would have pulled apart. What scientists have discovered is that the laws that are necessary to make the universe exist, they have been fine-tuned. They are just perfect to make the universe appear. And so when they consider, could this be an accident? A God. These scientists are saying it just can't be an accident. Or take, for example, Mr. Anthony Flew. For 50 years, he's a British philosopher who taught at Oxford. And for 50 years, he made a living being the leading atheist in the world. And one of the things that he would always say, essentially, is this. We must follow the evidence wherever it leads. And he would argue, and the evidence does not lead to the existence of God. God does not exist. 50 years. Say 50 years. 50 years. Then in 2004, the AP released an article all over the news hit. The AP went all over the world. That the world's leading atheist had changed his mind. What led to that change? Well, 2003, the human genome was finally mapped. And in that moment, we learned more about genes and DNA and all that kind of stuff than we had ever known before. 
Uh, and at the center of the DNA, I think there's this thing that they, they call the nucleotides. This is what they tell me. I'm not a scientist. I'm just following what they tell me. Nucleotides. Say nucleotides. Yeah, 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 yeah. And they're identified by four letters that I remember by accurate. I, 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 here's how I remember these, these four letters. I just call them <laughs> uh, 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 at God command. A-T-G-C. That's what it means, right? That's what it means to be. But anyway, they, they represent uh, these nucleotides that show up in multiple pairs, base pairs, and we have about three billion base pairs in our human anatomy. anatomy. And at the very core of these base pairs, each of them are specific instructions that gives birth to every aspect of your anatomy. Written code, actually. More powerful than any computer code because these codes produce the human anatomy. Each of your bodies and my bodies have been produced by this. Once all of this was discovered and the leading atheist looked at this up close in person, looked at how overwhelming it is, Here what he's, here's what he writes. How can a universe of mindless matter produce beings with cold. Here we are dealing with an entirely different category of problem, he says. These genetic instructions have specific meaning, effective only in an environment capable of interpreting the code, which means the human body in which they appear. And so he concludes, accident or God? And he says, there must now be a God. Wow. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities clearly seem being understood by what is made. So that is the first clue. The first clue is design. Say design. <laughs> Beckons you to consider. The second clue is morality. Can you say morality? Yeah. Morality. Here's, the, here's what we've discovered. Every human being everywhere has an innate sense of right and wrong. I'm talking about categories of right and wrong, fairness and unfairness. For example, you can out on the play yard in Palo Alto, uh, East Palo Alto, you can hear that five-year-old little girl cry out, that's not fair. And that cry is represented by kids, is reproduced by kids all over the world. Argentina, El Salvador, Nigeria, South Korea, kids of all persuasion, little kids make the same judgment. How? How do we get these notions of right and wrong and fairness and unfairness and justice and injustice? Why? Even if we disagree on what's right and what's wrong. The fact that we have these categories almost as though they are the, there is this moral code that's built within each of us. Where did it come from? Here's what Paul writes when he's writing to the Christians in the church in Rome it was made up of Jew, Jewish Christians who, at that point, initially was lives was governed by the Jewish law, and everybody else is referred to as Gentiles. Here's what he writes. Even Gentiles who do not have God's written law show that they know his law. How? When they instinctively obey it. Why is this? Even without having heard it, they instinctively obey it. You see, they demonstrate that God's law is written in their what? And their own what? And thoughts either accusing them, meaning they figure out they've done something wrong, or when they do something right. Here's what Dr. King says about this. And I love Dr. King. I just discovered this quote uh, last week, and this is fascinating. And here's what he says. Some things are right and some things are wrong. Eternally so. Absolutely so. It's wrong to hate, for example. It always has been wrong, 
It always will be wrong. It's wrong in America. It's wrong in Germany. It's wrong in Russia. It's wrong in China. It was wrong in 2000 BC, and it's wrong in 1954 AD when he gave this speech. It always has been wrong. It always will be wrong. Some things in this universe are absolute. The God of the universe has made it so. Somebody say amen. <laughs> Dr. King. Yeah, you can applaud that. Go ahead. Go ahead. That's the words of Dr. King. <laughs> Dr. King is essentially saying, the God of the universe has implicitly put in our hearts this notion of right and wrong. Points to the fact there must be a God. So one clue is design. Another clue is this notion of morality. And yet, a third clue is beauty. Say beauty. beauty. Have you ever had that meal that was so fantastic? It just made you close your eyes. <laughs> just relax in the sublimeness. Wow. I, have, have you ever heard a song, whether it be symphony or country music or rap or R&B, but it just puts you in a different space? Before you know it, tears start to flow. Can you say beauty? Uh, I want to, as I was preparing this, I thought about Mali, and I'm going to mention in a moment, it's just a reminder that we need to continue to pray for the people in Mali, uh, Maui, excuse me. What is it? Maui, Maui thank you, Maui. <laughs> uh, you would think I would know that. Anyway, uh, we just, as a matter of fact, we just delivered $40,000 to them just last week in person. <laughs> When my wife and I got married, it took us five years before we could afford a honeymoon. And our honeymoon we took was in Maui. Now I remember standing on the beach and watching the sun go down. If you've ever been on one of those Hawaiian islands, it is just spectacular. And there's something watching that that is so transcendent. It's just, it, it just something in you. I've heard even atheists will say this. There's something in you that just makes you go, gosh, there's got to be something. It's got to be something. I took my family to uh, the Grand Canyon uh, many, many years ago. And again, the same experience watching the awesomeness. That there was something that just beckoned. There's a power, there's a life, there's a mind, there's something greater than all that that has produced this beauty. Here's how the psalmist describes it. Here's the psalmist's explanation. He says this, the heaven proclaims the glory of God. The skies displays his craftsmanship. Day after day, they continue to speak to us. Night after night, they make him known. What does the skies and the heavens, what is, what is it that they say? They say, pay attention. There is a grand God of the universe and that he lives and that he is worthy of glory and praise. Somebody shout hallelujah. Mm. Design beckons us. Morality beckons us. Built in code. Beauty beckons us. But then, finally, there's what I call simply experience. Everybody say experience. experience. Your life experience, but in particular, watch this, the unexplainable experiences that show up in your story. You see, I, I hope that in these small discussion groups that you're not just interchanging on the level of intellectual reflection. I hope that you're going to also share your stories and your experiences. Whether you're talking about purpose or God or suffering or whatever the case is, exchange your stories. And I hope that you will look for, explore to see, is it possible that God has been involved in your story? 
in the unexplainable experiences of your story. Let me tell you three quick stories, and I'm coming to an end. Unexplainable. Last weekend, I was preparing the message. And uh, those of you who preach, I see Pastor McCray sitting back in the back, so he gets this. Uh, when you're preparing a message, half of the time is figuring out what you think you're going to say. The other half of the time is figuring out what you're going to put in and what you're going to take out. So Ephesians 2.10, everybody say Ephesians 2.10. was a passage I had settled on, and here's what it says. For we are God's hand that were created in Christ Jesus to do good works, shout good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. And so I said, hmm, I'm going to put this in. I'm going to use this. And then after a while, I said, no, I'm going to take it out. And then after a while, I said, no, I think I need to put it back in. And then finally, I said, no, I got too much already. I'm going to take it out. So I took it out. At about 3 o'clock, that's when I thought I had packaged everything and I was practicing the, the message I got a text, and the text came to me from Jamel. She was up here singing. She is our director of, of discipleship and life groups, and it, 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 I'm showing you the picture of the text. It just had simply. <laughs> I called Jamel. I said, Jamel. Did you intend to send me this text? She said, yes, sir. I said, I said, why? She said, I know it's kind of weird, isn't it? I said, no, talk to me. I, she said, listen, this is the deal, Pastor. She said, first of all, it's one of her favorite passages. She wears it around her neck. She said, all she knows is when she got up that day, it came to her, and she felt like God was saying, send this to Pastor Herman, send it to Pastor Herman. And she was like, this doesn't make any sense. So she said she resisted sending it to Pastor Herman. And then she said, later it just came back, send it to Pastor Herman. And so finally she said, okay, I'm going to send it. She said, Lord, should I put some context, you know, blah, 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 blah. And she said her sense from God was no, just send the passage. <laughs> so she did just that. She just sent Ephesians 2.10. Now let me ask you. Accident? Or God? Life's unexplainable experiences. Let me give you another one. Let me give you another one. Some of you heard this story. I just want to tell it again. Uh, and it is, uh, you, you've heard me talk about for one week, I was at Graham State University and I was praying, God, if you want me to preach, you just, you've got to make it emphatically clear. Because in the tough moments, I don't ever want to have to second guess that you're calling me to preach. I prayed Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night, Thursday night, Friday morning. I got up, said, got in my car to go see my dad for Christmas, stopped in a little town called Amstead, Louisiana. I was coming out of the filling station. A guy walked behind me. I turned around. He says, excuse me, sir. He says, um, uh, first of all, uh, I'm not even sure what town I'm in. I told him that. He said, are you a Christian? I said, yes. He says, well, maybe you'll understand this. When you walked out of the filling station, by the way, he was not even from Louisiana. He was passing through going to Texas. He was with a traveling Christian ministry. He said, when you walked out of the filling station, the Lord spoke to me, told me to come and tell you he's calling you to preach his word. Now, let me ask you. <laughs> Accident. Let me tell you a third story. This is about my wife. My wife is Dr. Rhonda Hamilton, and yeah, celebrate her. I, by the way, for those of you who always wonder, if you say, well, I never see your wife. Well, she is here every single Sunday, but she likes hiding in the back there somewhere. So anyway, she's an amazing doctor, uh, leads a huge department at the hospital that she does, all that. But here's how she became a doctor. At 13 years of age, 14 years of age, she told God, if, if you ask me to do anything, if you make it clear to me that you're asking me, I'll do it. At 17 years of age, she's flying in uh, to come to Graham State University. The Lord whispers to her, you're going to meet your husband on the first day. That actually happens. 11 months later, we're married. 
Five years fast forward, she doesn't hear the voice of God in any dramatic way like that. She's one practum away from finishing up her degree in English literature, a master's degree. She has a full-time job at University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff. We're in Pine Bluff, waiting on the table with a guarantee that it will, it will open up to a pathway for her becoming uh, the department head of English at the University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff. All she had to do was just finish that semester. In that moment, the Lord speaks to her again and says, I'm calling you to be a doctor. This was so out of left field. Never thought about being a doctor. She'd never even seen a black doctor in her life. She's already about to initiate her, her career. So she's like, I'm not even sure this is God. So God began to, 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 to speak to her more frequently to help her to become comfortable. This is the voice. And here's one of those things that happened. A few days later, she's in the mall, Pine Bluff, and she sees this young woman with this beautiful set of braids. She goes up to the young woman. She says, wow, your braids are just awesome. I, I'm, I want some of those braids. Give me the... How do I get in touch with the person? So anyway, the woman gave her the name and the number of the person who did her braids. They, Rhonda and this person, didn't even exchange names. So Rhonda goes home super excited. And later that evening, she hears God says, don't call that person. So now Rhonda's super confused. Like, this can't be God. What is God? Is God concerned about when I'm wearing braids or not? That's not. <laughs> that night, don't call the person. Next morning, don't call the person. So Rhonda says she's in the bathroom brushing her teeth, and she's wrestling with God. This can't be you. This doesn't make no sense. And the phone rings. And some of you may recall back in the day, there used to be answering services. <laughs> so the phone call went to the answering service, and, you know, you could screen. And so she was listening, and the voice came on the other side. It says, Mrs. Hamilton, you don't know who I am, but you met me in the mall just yesterday. And I'm, I, I'm calling to tell you, do not call the person I told you to call. Rhonda ran to the thing, picked up the phone, and said, she said, the first thing she said was, how did you get my number? And how do you know my name? Because none of that was exchanged. And the young woman whose name is uh, Camario, and Rhonda and her are 30 years good friends now, she said, well, this is going to sound kind of strange, but I woke up this morning and God told me that I needed to contact you and tell you not to make the call. Turns out that the woman who did the braids was in a relationship with a very abusive person. And, and, and the concern was Rhonda going into that circumstance, in that situation. So she says, uh, the Lord told me I need to call you. And I didn't even know how. And he brought back to my mind that a year ago you came in, you know, small town, so people know when new people show up. So you came into the podiatrist's office where I worked when you and your husband first got here. And I went back and I went through the Rolodex Around that time, and I found your name. So I'm calling you to tell you, do not call. Accident or God? Well, Rhonda says, thank you. She's still not convinced that God wants her to go into medicine. So later on that day, that evening, she says, God, I, I, I'm still not convinced. I'm so sorry. So God says, okay, here's what we're going to do. Keep in mind, God is speaking to Rhonda, so don't go do this on your own. He says, I want you to take a piece of paper, tear it up in 10 different places. Tear it up 10 pieces. Write yes on one of them. Take all of the balls of paper, ball them up, throw them behind you, right in front of the bed. And I'm going to tell you what's going to happen, God says. One is going to stay on the bed. The other is going to be off the bed. And when you open it, the one will say yes. So Rhonda, boom, 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 boom. Boom, turned around, all of the stuff fell off the bit except one. She went and opened, and when she opened it, the word was yes. Accident? Or oh God? But she still wasn't convinced. <laughs> so the next day, by the way, just like some of y'all not convinced. Right? Just like God keeps engaging and engaging and showing up in your life and you keep discounting it and discounting it and discounting it. That's where Rhonda was. I just don't think this can be you. The next day she says she's sweeping in front of the TV and the Lord spoke to her and says, this is the last time I'm going to speak to you. This is the last confirmation I'm going to give you. 
turn on the TV, Jeopardy is going to be on. If the final category has anything to do with medicine, that's your final word. <laughs> Ronald Loop, Jeopardy was one of her favorite shows. It was time for Jeopardy, all I'm saying. So she turns the TV on just in time to hear Alex Trebek say, we'll be right back with the final Jeopardy category. So Rhonda sits and wait. They return. Alex Trebek says the final Jeopardy category is medical history. So my friends, I ask you, accident or oh God? And here's where I want to conclude this message, and I'm finished. Here's where I want to conclude this message. I've talked about clues, and I, I've talked about hints. Uh, I'm reminded that Pascal, the French uh, uh, philosopher, once said that there's a hole in the heart of every person. It is in the shape of God, and only God can fill it. But over the years, I've flipped it. I've said that there is a hole in the heart of God. It's in the shape of you. And only you can feel it. And that means that God wants to expose God's self to you. And he's not just waiting on a message like this. I hear some of you can think and say, well, I've never had these dramatic experiences like you and Sister Rhonda and Jamel. Uh, uh, well, let me just say uh, it this way. Sometimes God will pick a few folk like us to have those dramatic experiences so we can share them with you so that it can help convince you that you are not an accident, that you are a byproduct of a love. Loving God. But he would not simply leave you to make a decision based on my experience. Listen, my grandmother, she used to cook tea cakes. And she would say when she was baking tea cakes, she'd say, I'm going to put a hint of cinnamon. Can you say a hint? And when you're eating the tea cake, you would taste a hint. It was, a, it was a small portion of a larger experience that existed. And I just want to conclude this by saying that God has given you hints, y'all, that are not just clues, but they are small experiences of the larger reality of a God that loves you. So when I talk about design, come on now, just think about your heart. Uh, I'm told that your heart beats between childhood to 70 years old about 2.8 billion times. Every time your heart beats, without a computer chip, come on now, without a battery. That is the power of God you're experiencing in your life. Every time you inhale and exhale and wake up to see another day, that's the power of God operating in your life. Morality, every time you watch TV and see something that makes you say, that's not fair, or you're moved to march for justice, that's the power of God operating in your life. Every time you see beauty and it connects with something within, that is the power of God. Come on now. Calling you to open up your heart and open up your heart, your mind, and believe that he is there. But in all of those unexplainable experiences, if you had showed up five minutes late, you would have missed the love of your life. The car accident happened. But you walked out with nothing, no, no scar. And all of those unexplainable experiences, that is the power of God operating in your life. Did you get up this morning? That's God. Did you get here today? That's God. You watching me online? That's God. Shout hallelujah. Shout praise be to God. He is. Praise the Lord. Come on, Pastor Dan. Remain standing. Remain standing. I, I, I know what you're saying. Well, if God exists, 
And I'm more or less more persuaded now. How do you explain all this suffering and pain, Pastor? Next week. Yeah. <laughs>